It's women protecting women. I thought this would be a great thing to join. I wanted to be a part of them. You know, I watched all the videos and I read all the material I put on them and stuff like that, and I thought, I don't want to watch this anymore. I want to be there. I want to see it. I really wanted to help with the women's revolution. And then I found out about a recruiting page on Facebook and I contacted that page. And then they put me in touch with a YPJ recruiter and it just went from there. And that was uh, October 2014. She used to be a fashion model and a biker, but one day Hannah Bowman decided to switch her life of comfort in Canada for the unforgiving battlefields of Syria and is one of many Western volunteers to have joined the Kurdish-led fight against Islamic State. I was never a professional model. I dabbled in it almost 15 years ago. You know, I'd rather be known as, you know, the Canadian who joined the fight for women's rights, not the ex-model who, you know, of all the things to be known by, that's kind of lame. And what's particularly annoying is that when a new story comes out, oh, the ex-model did this and that, there's always people commenting and there's like, what kind of model was she? Like a hand model? She's hideous. Right? So it's just like you miss the whole point of the story. The point of the story is that women are fighting ISIS. Right? The complete opposite. You have the ISIS that wants to enslave the world, and then you have the YPJ that wants to free the world. And they're fighting each other, good versus evil in the truest sense. And all you're worried about is some fucking chick that you may or may not have been a model at one time. You know? The first time I was smuggled across the border into Syria, we had to drive for quite a ways to get to the border. and. And it was a river crossing, so in the middle of the night, we had to go across in a rubber dinghy. It was really inspiring to see people from all over coming to join. Like, there's, a, there's some Swedish girls, a British girl, a Polish girl, Italian girl, you know, some Canadian girls. I think the first time I was smuggled over there, I was just so caught up in the adventure of it all that I was just amazed. Like, you know, it felt so much better than what I was doing back home. I was the, the third Western woman at the time, so they were still trying to figure things out. I was supposed to go for 15 days of training, end up being five days. All I learned was to tear out the AK. At the academy, they gave me an AK and they took me to the range and like, you know, see how well I could shoot that. And uh, I used Denise's gun, the girl that they had sent to instruct me. She was like really impressed. She was like, oh, I have a sniper. So then they gave me the sniper rifle. See what I'm trying to do? Yeah. Trying to make you not focus. Because in war, you'll, it would not be my voice. That gunshots and all kinds of weapons around. Okay, that was scary. You should warn me, women. <laughs> hmm? You should warn me, I'm gonna shoot. Uh, now I've been stationed to a unit. This is my unit. Um, about a kilometer away from Daesh, which is what they call ISIS. We do everything on the dirt. We sleep on the dirt, we work on the dirt, we cook on the dirt, we eat on the dirt, and we shit on the dirt. I'm in my... <clears throat> this is my bunker. It's Thailand. This is This is my gun. There are many guns like it, this one is mine. If I had to describe what it's like out here, it's a good healthy dose of Mad Max. Because a lot of the stuff here is homemade and looks Mad Max-ish. And uh, it's like touch of Survivor. It's really just camping. It's just camping with guns, that's all it is. And uh, hunting people instead of deer. I didn't have any communication with the outside world for, I think it was six weeks at first. Especially in the beginning, cell phones were banned completely. Turns out my father died the, the day after I sent out my last message. So a month ago. I wasn't close to my father or anything. I barely knew him. There's no way I was going to spend thousands of dollars and rush back there to see some stranger on his deathbed. 
I mean, it's, I feel bad for him dying of cancer like that, but whatever. We all die, one way or the other. I can get a bullet in my head any time now. Well, I think I was there about six weeks and I was going crazy. Most of the time I spent waiting for something to happen. And the commanders, they could tell though. So I ended up going to a different unit, a mobile unit, a fighting unit. And my first night there, uh, we get in a firefight. So I'm just like, yeah, okay, this is where I want to be. I'm happy now. I think it was the second or third day I was walking from the outhouse back to where we were staying and a sniper started shooting at me. Right about here, and all of a sudden you could hear it cross and then hear the gunshot. So I hit the ground and then it was like, another one? So the sniper's definitely gunning for me. I'm gonna have to mess with them somehow. I was the sniper in my unit. I was the only sniper in my unit. Like a real sniper, you need patience, right? You have to be able to lie in the dirt, in the heat all day. Camel spiders walking on you. favorite tactic of ISIS is the suicide truck. And the more desperate they get, the more trucks they send. Of course, you don't want them coming near you. In my one unit, we had five trucks come at us in one day. You just want to keep the enemy as far away from you as you can, right? You see them, you shoot at them. You don't want them getting close enough to you that they can start throwing grenades and shit at you. Keep them away. You know, if you can kill them, great. All I know is that when we are shooting them, when we are killing them, the girls are doing that Middle East yodel to let them know that it's the women who are killing you. And like in the beginning, I would wonder, you know, like, oh, well, you know, they had somebody, they had a mother that loved them and stuff like that. Now it's just like, my friends had mothers that loved them too. The best way to describe Kobani at that time was obliterated. I mean, so many were killed there. It really is the martyred city. And it's just rubble. A lot of kids living in the rubble. The country's been reduced to nothing, so yeah, I don't blame them for wanting to leave. The refugees were just fleeing Syria. And some went across the border in Turkey and then took rafts over to Greece. I feel sorry for the ones that stayed, actually, because there's so much. There's no guarantee of peace in the future. There's always going to be another war. They had an opportunity to leave, and they took it. I don't blame them at all. We would do the same thing. Now they have a chance at a new life. We would all do the same thing. I would. A lot of people keep asking me to help them get to Canada. If I had a seat on a plane for everybody who asked me to help them, the plane would be full. I was not used to hanging around with a lot of girls. I didn't grow up in the West hanging out with girls. You know, as a tomboy, most of my friends were boys and stuff, so I used to fight and throw rocks and climb trees with them. But, uh, you know, by the time I went to my second unit, I was really starting to bond with the girls. people are shooting at you and you're shooting back, I think that kind of stress, you know, knowing that we're living on that edge is what brings us close together. You know, we all suffer together.